uh, it is the uh, extraordinarily well-dressed Gary Carter. Gary always makes me feel spectacularly scruffy, uh, not difficult, I'll grant you. Um, before joining Shine, uh, sorry, Gary is currently the chairman of Northern Europe and Shine 360, uh, a fantastic job title, I think you'd all agree. Before joining Shine, Gary was the COO of Fremantle Media, managing all of their European production operations, their digital and central IP departments. For five years prior to this, he was executive director of program affairs at Endemol, where among other things, uh, among many other things, he was responsible for the international rollout of Big Brother. Um, Apart from collecting a, a series of very impressive job titles, he is also uh, a truly lovely guy, Mr. Gary Carter. Being a lovely guy, of course, is a prerequisite for a career in television. Good afternoon, everybody. Five years ago, I used to say that there were three questions one was always asked at the end of a speech to an industry conference like this one. It's probably clear that the answer to these first two questions are one, yes, and two, advertising and subscription. But the subtext, and indeed the subject of every conference session like this one, the subject of every conversation on every stand at every market like this one, and probably the principal agenda of every meeting held on every day of the week in every independent production company and every broadcaster on the planet is the third question. This is the question which obsesses all hit-driven businesses. This is the question which obsesses the current non-scripted television production business, a business still locked into a 19th century industrial cost plus margin model, even though media exploitation as a whole is about value and not about the cost of production. A hit is the only way that a production company frees itself from the limited marginal profit of production and starts to derive profit from the value the market places on the product. This is why hits are so transformative for the companies who have them. And of course, the value-based model is the one which underlies the broadcasting business, if not the production business. And that is why the broadcaster resists value-based discussions with its suppliers, the production companies, on the one hand, and yet seeks to control the rights from which value is derived on the other. This is the question that has become more important to production companies like those on this stage as the content industry has globalized. This is because the global market for television formats is increasingly about international market value, not local cost of production. It is therefore the vital question at the heart of consolidation amongst super independence and vertical integration in studio groups. It is the question which will become even more important as digital challenges to traditional broadcasters start to emerge. The globalization of distribution reach and the challenge to the terrestrial near monopoly of traditional broadcasters will, I sincerely hope, help to shift the debate at a local level towards value. They used to say in Hollywood that there are three ingredients needed for a hit movie, but that no one can remember what they are. Or to quote the screenwriter William Goldman, nobody knows anything. Goldman later explained that he meant that nobody knows anything except the consumer, because in hit-driven businesses, the consumer decides. And this is why a whole area of consultancy has developed, which justifies its considerable fees by reassuring the content industry that it, at least, understands the consumer. From the organizers of focus groups to the trend analysts and the forecasters, and it's also the thinking behind the use of big data as a predictor of taste. So one answer to the, to the question, what is the next big thing, is the consumer will decide. The fact is that the next big thing is unpredictable from within the industry which both generates and relies on it. In 16th century England, the term black swan became synonymous with the impossible, the unimaginable. There was no evidence to suggest that swans were anything other than white until, that is, the Dutch explorer Willem de Vlaming went to Western Australia in 1697 and found, indeed, the black swan. In the theory developed by the scholar, philosopher, and statistician Nassim Nicholas Taleb, 
Black swan events are expressions of assumptions and understandings of randomness, probability, and uncertainty. And according to him, black swan events have three defining characteristics. Number one, the event is a surprise to the observer. Number two, it has a major effect. Number three, it is rationalized in retrospect, as if it could have been expected. Rather, the relevant data was available, but not taken into account in risk mitigation. Taleb adds another observation, that a small number of black swans explains almost everything about the world. One answer to the question, therefore, is the following. We are always surprised by the success of a format at this scale. We did not foresee that success. For all our sophisticated knowledge, our claims to expert, expertise, and despite layers of management engaged in risk mitigation. And the small number of black swan events explains almost everything in the world of non-scripted television. The next big thing will come from nowhere. It will have a major effect. And we, we, will construct a narrative which explains its origins and its success, and then we will try unsuccessfully to apply that narrative to the future. And we will tattoo onto the forehead of every poor development producer something like this. And we will ask this question even though we did not know where the last big thing came from. But I think we can go further. Not only does the industry not know what the next big thing is, but we don't actually know what we mean by big thing. In a general sense, we probably mean an entertainment format which travels to more territories than any other in living memory. Best in class probably being who wants to be a millionaire at about 100 or so territories depending on how you count. And how you count is becoming more and more important. And given the importance of the first mover advantage, we can probably add a time dimension to our definition. A big thing is an entertainment format that travels to more country than any other in the shortest possible time. But if I am correct, and the next big thing is a black swan, the significance of a big thing is in the effect that it has, and in the disruptive change it causes, because it is the disruption, the innovation, that ultimately generates the value. In my professional career, we have seen a small number of black swan events. A few examples of these formats and their impact on the market. Celador's handling of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, now owned by Sony, made it imperative for the global formats that followed to have a consistent global branding. This was not the case before Millionaire. Further, by retaining the ancillary and other secondary rights to itself, Celador demonstrated how much money could be made from the skillful exploitation of a coherent global identity for a show, and the skillful handling of those secondary rights, to the extent of winning eight Oscars for an international feature film derived from those ancillary rights. Endemol's Big Brother represented a genre shift. It revealed the full force of reality television. Genre shifts are probably the most difficult and most significant of black swan effects in formats. Together with Castaway's Survivor, Big Brother caused a fundamental shift in the importance of unscripted television, since it became clear that this new genre could hold its own in the face of the hitherto unchallenged power of scripted television in the United States. Further, CBS's scheduling of the two formats in the US summer of 2000 changed the seasonal structure of the American television season forever. Simon Fuller and Fremantle Media's pop idol changed the relationship between television and the music industry, although perhaps not to the extent hoped for by the music industry, and proved that secondary sales of reality shows could generate huge amounts of money through distribution. And as a PS, it introduced the texting habit to America that's helping to make the SMS one of the mainstays of global communication. Arguably, it opened up a new promise of interactivity, which became the mantra of subsequent formats. Shine Group's treatment of Frank Rodham's MasterChef proved not only that food is a subject for prime time, but also a subject for long arc competitive reality formats. It also demonstrated that it is possible to update and reinvent older formats for contemporary audiences. 
One of the interesting things about big things, when you consider them chronologically, is that because the innovations in such, format, in such formats tend to unlock value, and because, as Taleb argues, we retrospectively create a narrative to explain the event, the innovations of each big thing tend to become viewed as necessary to the formats that follow, across the spectrum from rip-off to inspired by. And so we find ourselves surrounded by formats which copy the innovations of preceding successful ones, because the retrospective narrative we construct to explain the original Black Swan says that the format's success is dependent on that innovation. This is perhaps the biggest effect of the Black Swan event, and is why I assert that a small number of such events explain everything about current entertainment television. But black swan theory says that you cannot predict where or how the black swan will arise, and it is therefore unlikely that the next hit will relate to the one before it in that way. In other words, the inclusion of an innovation in a subsequent format is not a guarantor of any kind of success at all, even while the producer and the broadcaster might expect that it should be. It is impossible to predict the next big thing. And if that is the case, it's worth asking whether one is among us already, but whether we can't tell because the effect is not yet clear. I've been interested, as I'm sure we all have, in the case of Kishet's Rising Star, not because of the content of the format, nor the claims to interactivity. I've been wondering whether it is a black squan because of the incredible skill of the sales and marketing strategy that Keshet followed. We all know, or we think we know, how successful Israel has been recently in generating hit formats. In the run-up to MIPCOM last year, producer interest in Rising Star ran high. But according to my sources, Keshet's response to this interest was to affirm that broadcaster interest was required. This meant that broadcasters were getting calls from producers, in effect, marketing the show. And according to Cachette's website, the show has been sold to more than 20 such broadcasters, and as far as I can ascertain, to most of them directly, and not to the producers who made the original calls. At MIPCOM last year, everyone was talking about Rising Star's incredible success. By November, when Cachette organized its in-TV conference in Jerusalem, uncoincidentally during the transmission of the show, Broadcasters were flying in from around the world to see the live transmission of the show. Everyone in the industry heard of its extraordinary performance. To quote Cachette's website, an overwhelming response sets a new bar for the future of talent shows, an incredible 33.8% rating and 47.4% average share, number one in the charts, breaking ratings records, series finale achieved a remarkable 40.3 rating and 58% share. However, if we look at the top 10 shows in Israel in 2013 for all viewers, four plus, the picture is somewhat different. Despite the international perception of the success of original Israeli non-scripted content, the reality is that 60% of the top 10 entertainment shows in Israel in 2013 were adaptations of existing international formats, with MasterChef as the most successful show of the year. In terms of talent shows, Tulpa's The Voice was the most successful, followed by Rising Star and then Psycho's X Factor. But Rising Star only ranked seven in the overall top 10. So despite the perception Based on the impact of existing global formats, Israel is an IP consumer and not an IP generator. And arguably, that is in part because the rights and regulatory framework are heavily in favor of the broadcaster. Rising Star shows clearly the way that successive formats accumulate the innovations of their predecessors. It's a reality show. It's a talent show. It's a talent show for singing. It has live vote voting. It lays claim to live event status. It has an app. It's too early to tell whether it will be a big thing in the sense of moving successfully to a really large number of territories, although all the signs are that it will. It's clearly not moving into production at speed, however, the second dimension I described above. It's too early to tell whether its much-vaunted innovation, its live voting app, is really going to be the killer application Kishet believes it to be, although personally, I doubt it. 
And it's actually too early to tell whether consumers will make Rising Star the next big thing and unlock its true value for cachette. But Rising Star might yet still prove to be a black swan. It seems to me that one of its lasting effects will be the legacy of the scale of its marketing to the industry itself. The extraordinary skill of Cachette's marketing of the format unlocked value earlier in the chain than ever before. After all, it's only been on air in Israel. You can see some of the implications of an increased focus on industry marketing for all of us in the way in which Tulpa has positioned Utopia amongst potential customers. We may yet be entering a period in which the sales and marketing of formats to potential buyers requires more strategy, more marketing knowledge, and much, much more money than it does now, perhaps more money than small companies have at their disposal. But the story of Rising Star is in part the story of the marketing of a country within the industry. It's a country with a good story, a true story, a small, engaged population with a strong technology focus, one with an entrepreneurial history and with a degree of social turmoil which makes self-definition through cultural production important to the people who live there. And so perhaps the more interesting and perhaps more answerable question as we go into this market is the following. Thank you very much.